Now, we've been talking about when the church becomes the church, and we put that in present tense. Because too often in our culture and in our church, we get too focused on what's going on around us and not who we are and whose we are. And this morning, I want to challenge you as we get ready to break open this bread is know whose you are. Because if you know whose you are, you'll know how to respond to situations and things you go through in this life. Amen. Let's pray. God, we love you. I ask you as we come before you today, Father, that you would revelation in every heart and every one of us. Lead us, guide us, and direct us, God, for your kingdom. Lord, show us and teach us how to deny ourselves in every situation. And everything we go through, and every circumstance we go through, God, may we learn to deny ourselves. It may not be comfortable. It may be belittling. But God, that's part of carrying the cross. Because the cross brought to you public shame. The cross brought to you humility. And the cross eventually brought your physical death. But God, I ask you in our hearts that we... As Paul wrote to us, we learn to die daily for your kingdom's sake. That your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth through us, your vessels surrendered to you. As it is in heaven. And we'll give you the praise for it. Birth your word in our heart today. And give us kingdom purpose. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning. Um. Who you are matters. Who you are outside the church, who you are in everyday life, who you are matters. Have you, uh, has anybody in here this week, and you don't have to raise your hand, has anybody in here complained this week, had an issue this week? Well, I have. And uh, we get, you ever notice how them complaints and them things that we get to let me tell you what Proverbs, Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those that love it will eat its fruit. I'm going to read that again. Proverbs 18.21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Did you know that we can speak the trouble we have in everyday life? We can speak that into existence. We can get so focused on what we going through and nobody understands what I'm dealing with and nobody knows what I, 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 me. (sighs) And we wind up, where's the peace of God? When I'm speaking all of the things that that is negative in this world, and I speak it and I capture that, if that was ever, if there was room for that in our life as a Christian, it'd be okay, but there's not room for that in the life of a believer. And that's what I want to encourage you in today. That is, when, when the, in Acts chapter 4, we read this part last week, but in Acts chapter 4, after Paul and Barnabas, they they. Heal this man. They, they, they said, fix your eyes on us. Look at us. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the man left leaping and praising God. And then the culture, the, the, the culture noticed, oh, no, they ain't. And see, this is, we talked about it last week, just be quiet. And if we match what the world does, if, if our anxieties, if our pressure and if our, if everything we go through, if we focus on that and we speak what the world speaks, the world don't care. And then the world stands outside the church and says, if that's what the church is, I'm going to live just like I'm living and I'm going to be fine. But the heart of a believer and the heart of a believer, the heart of the believer is not this pump right here. The heart of the believer is the mind. And when the mind ain't right, the tongue don't speak right. I want that to sink in a little bit. When the heart ain't right, the tongue don't speak right. 
So there's no, how do I deny myself in the face of adversity? Well, how did Paul and Silas deny their self in the face of adversity? They went, and in verse 23, I'm going to challenge you to read some of it, but I want to pick it up in verse 26. The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers gathered together against the Lord and against the, his Christ. For truly, against your holy servant Jesus, whom you have anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, and the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now the Lord, look on their, on their threats and grant to your servant that this is their prayer that they're praying. This is their prayer. And grant to your servants with that boldness they may speak your word. And here's what I want to challenge us to do. How do we fix the problems going on in our culture today is that the church begin to speak his word. When we feel our word about to come out of our mouth, stop that thing quickly. Stop that thing quickly. How hard is it? How much control do you have over what you say? You, you, you can control every bit of what you say, but there has to be a conscious inside of you, a consciousness inside of you. The Holy Spirit has to be directing you, stop, don't do that. You ever felt that? You ever felt, the, don't do that? And then you did it anyway. And then we'll get like Flip Wilson, the devil made me do it. The devil can't make us do anything. He, he cannot cross the bloodline when the blood has been applied. When, Like Jared said this morning, when you have been branded, the devil has no more authority over you. Amen. Hello? Has no more authority. Only what you will allow him to have. And if there's a hole in your fence, I promise you'll cross back over to the other side. Amen. And when you cross back over to the other side, that's where you get spotted up, and that's where you get tainted, and that's where you get corrupt, corrupted. And the church needs to walk closer with Jesus and way away from this world. Culture ain't going to change. This world ain't going to change. When you turn on the news and there's nothing positive going on, it's enough to make you turn it off and talk for an hour about all the bad stuff going on in our world. People being killed, just murdered, slaughtered. Like over in Russia, they just wipe them out. Just, why? What's going on? When hearts are not in tune with Jesus, that is the result. That is the result. And I want you to know around here, everybody is safe and protected. We got, I pity, I'm like uh, Mr. T on, uh, I can't remember the name of that show, but Mr. T said, I pity the fool. I pity the fool to come in here and try some mess like that. Because we have measures in place to protect. And guys, I'm telling you, as we walk in this world, we don't need to worry about what this world is doing. What we need to worry, if there's any, worry is, is an attribute of unbelief. I'm going to say that again. Worry is an attribute of unbelief. If we, but, and we shouldn't even be worrying about nothing. But if you're going to worry, we need to worry about how, what kind of an impression we're making on the culture. Amen. Instead of what the culture is making on me. It don't matter what this world does. It didn't matter what the world did. Because Paul and Silas, when they had prayed and they prayed this prayer, I want you to watch in verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. I'm going to tell you what, when we begin to trust in, call on, and, it, and exalt the name of the Most High God, then this place will be shaken. And I, it may not be physically, but I'm going to tell you what, the community, the place, people's hearts can be shaken because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. We don't preach ourselves, we preach Jesus Christ and him crucified in the resurrection by his almighty power. That's what we preach. 
And the place they were filled was shaken. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the Word of God with boldness. This is what needs to happen instead of letting your anxieties and what's going on in this world be them what drives your thought and what drives your talk. Let it be changed and start speaking the Word of God with boldness in the face of your adversity. When the church begins to do that, when the, pe- the church ain't the church without you as individuals. And when we as individuals begin to speak like that, God will do great things. Flip over with me to Acts chapter 16. All went, and look, Paul and Silas was in this adversity when this happened to them right here. But I'm going to pick up, I've wrote in Acts chapter 16, I want to challenge you to go home and read 16 through 30. But I'm going to pick up in verse 20. Barbara, I know I messed you up there, but here it goes. Now, let me give you a little backstory here. There was a girl that had a, a, a spirit of being a medium. She was a, a, a fortune teller. And her family made money off of her. They used her to make money because if, if, if somebody could tell you your fortune, and well, they pay them money. They do that now. It's called palm readers. Stay away from that garbage. Stop giving Satan real estate in your life. If you do that, move away from it. That is garbage. If you want to know what your future is, put your trust and your faith in Jesus. And this girl is following Paul and Paul and them around and saying, they, they preach the gospel, they preach salvation. They preach in salvation of Jesus. They speak of Jesus of now. And Paul got annoyed with her. You're getting on my nerves. And when they, she had got on their nerves, in verse 20 it says, they had got, Paul turned around and rebuked her. And she got saved. This girl's life was changed. And the people got mad about it. And they said, these people are coming against our culture. I'm paraphrasing it a little bit. They're coming against our culture. Because why? Paul spoke the word of God with boldness. What's what's wrong in, in the church today is the church ain't speaking the word of God with boldness. Because we know more about our problems than we do about his promise. We know more about our problems than we do about his promise. And when we begin to speak his promise, so Paul and them spoke the promise over this young lady. Her life was changed. And then they go to to the magistrates and watch what happens here in verse 20. And when they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. This is why they want Ten Commandments off of courthouse walls. It's because that word is powerful. That word is all power. That word changes men. That word convicts men. That word changes men. That word changes the direction of a nation. That word, it's always been that way from the beginning of time all the way through the Old Testament and the New Testament. But today it needs to begin to happen again. And it's got to start with us when the church becomes the church. It says in verse 21, And they teach customs, troubling our exceedingly, let's see, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us being Romans to receive or observe. And then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. And having received such a charge, he put them into their inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now, man, ain't that a thing? I mean, come on, Lord. If Paul and Silas, if they had any right to gripe and complain, it's now. Right? Lord, why are you letting this happen to me? You ever said that? Why are you letting this happen to me, Lord? Why am I having to go through this? If anybody had a right at that moment to go that way, they did. But watch what happens in verse 
25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. What? After, after a beating and after being locked up in jail and then chained in, into that jail? And the prisoners were listening. They were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison were shaken. Here's the second time there was a great shaking going on. Hello. It comes from us in Acts chapter 4. The place where they were praying was shaken. Here it comes again. The foundations were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone in the chains were loosened. And the keeper of the prison awake. Awakening from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, Do not harm yourself for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, What must I do to be saved? You see what begins to happen when the people of God do what God wants us to do? Happens. You see what begins to happen? Jesus hanging on the cross. In Luke chapter 23 verse 34. He prayed, Father, forgive them after he had been beaten. After he had been a crown of thorns shoved on his head toted his cross, and now he's hung, hanging in midair and suffering, and he says, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But I want to pick the story up in verse 39, and it said, Then one of the criminals who was hanged, who were hanged, blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. And verse 40 says, But the other, answering, rebuking him, saying, Do not... Even Do you not even fear God, seeing that you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And verse 42 says, and then, he said to, and then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. While Jesus was in a place of the deepest agony he could have possibly been in, he was about the Father's business. What is wrong with the church today is we're not about the Father's business in our anxiety, in our adversity, in our trouble, in everything that goes on in life. We focus on the trouble. We focus on the, everything going wrong and not the promise of the King. And God is calling us to a place of focusing Putting our focus and our trust back in Him. Do you not, do you make your life about a product of what is going on and what you're going through? Or do you make your life a product of what He went through for you? When we begin to praise Him, when we give Him the glory that's due His name. Now listen, we're going to get over here. We're going to find answers today to where the church needs to be and Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Y'all with me? It says, Therefore we also, since we are s- surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now let's back up. We know we're running the race. Let's back up here at verse 1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so, so great a crowd of witness, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us. Do you hear what Paul says here? The sin. If I'm grumbling and complaining and I'm always telling how big my troubles are, it's time to stop telling how big your troubles are and start telling your troubles how big your God is. (laughs) And run the race. It don't mean I ain't going to go through something. It don't mean I ain't got got some issues to go through. But we got to run this race. 
Are we running the race or are we in park setting still? Don't set still. Keep moving. Keep struggling. Keep fighting. Addiction. What, what you going through? Your addiction ain't bigger than my Jesus. And addiction comes in many forms. Addiction can be your gossip. It can be drugs. It can be alcohol. It can be pornography. There is a, a gossip, hatred, unforgiveness. You see the addiction? I'm addicted to that. I'm, so, ooh, I'm just enraged by what goes on inside of me. If you'll give Jesus his place in your life, you'll begin to glorify and you'll begin to magnify the king of glory because he moves all of that garbage out of you and he sets you free from the garbage that wants to ensnare your soul but it takes us surrendering our praise to him in the face of this adversity I've got you ever watch them marathons where they're running and then a big old rainstorm comes do they quit and call it off no they keep going they keep going And then we can look at it as old country boy says, man, my good Lord, my mama taught me better sense than to stand out in the rain. So we quit. The rain gets to be too much. So we quit, and then we wound up, wind up not even getting to finish the race, and we go, well, Dad Gum, what happened? I... I just took a break. Well, you took too long a break. I think that's what's going to happen to the church if we don't get with it. We're going to look up. And we're going to be left behind because we're not engaged in what God is calling us to be engaged in. Your problems are not bigger than you. Your problems are not bigger than God. We have to trust God through them problems. We're running the race. Remember, we're running the race. Habakkuk, it's a holdy place here in Hebrews. We're going to be coming back. Habakkuk 2 and 4 says this. Behold the proud. Behold the proud. Remember the world and everybody wanting Paul and Silas jailed and they're crucifying Jesus. That is a proud spirit. Are you with me? They're arrogant. They want to hang Jesus on the cross. We've, we've looked... The same people that was yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna, when he rode into town on the donkey, the ones that were yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna, are now the ones that's yelling, crucify him, crucify him. <laughs> but it, Habakkuk 2, 4 says, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. What is faith? That's what I believe in. There's an old, an old hymn that we sing. I know who I have believed in and am committed that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. And if I'm singing that kind of a song, there's got to be some adversity went on in the person that, was, that wrote that song and sang that song. There's got to be some adversity going on in that heart because it says, I know who I have believed in and I am committed. I am committed. How committed are we? I'm committed that he is able to keep what I have surrendered to him against that day. Hebrews 10, hold your place in 12, we're coming back. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast our confession of our hope without wavering. See, when there's the complaining and the grumbling and we're running our race and we're grumbling and complaining about, man, this, I'm just tired. I'm tired of this. I'm, Lord, where are you? I'm tired of wondering where God is. I'm tired of what I'm going through. I'm tired that I can't even... And, and that's where you get hung up. I can't walk in the freedom that God intends for me to walk in when I have that in my heart. He says, hold fast your confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Do you know that Colossians chapter 3 says, bear with one another. And confess to one another our faults so that, we can, that we're to, to have unity with one another. But brothers and sisters, when, we don't, when we're not honest about what we're going through and, we, and we're not giving the praise to who the praise needs to go for and we focus on the problem, nobody wants to hear that. Hello? And there winds up being no hope. 
But he comes in verse 25. He said, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more, as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of truth, there is no longer remain sacrifice for our sins. And there's one, the CBS version says, for if we sin deliberately. What is deliberately? If I keep grumbling and complaining and having issues about my life, then you've got a life you've not surrendered to Jesus. But when you surrender that life, you'll, you will give him the glory he deserves. Because you're going to go through adversity in this life. You're going to go through things that is not pleasant in this life. But you've got to remember that the Word of God says, Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. It's hard losing loved ones. And we, we wonder why. We wonder why this stuff happens. Why? There's never a good time to lose somebody. Amen? Never is there a good time to lose somebody, but it's appointed unto man once to die. So we have to have our trust and our hope is in Jesus so we know how to walk through. So we can, who we are trusting in, what we're walking through in them moments. It's not easy. It's not easy. But I know who I have believed in. So how should my heart be? My heart should be, as 1 Corinthians 13 says this right here. 1 Corinthians 13. Verse 4. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. He is not puffed up, does not behave rudely. Who is love? God is love. And when God is in control of my heart, this is the way my heart should respond to the situations that life deals. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. No matter what I'm... It, it, it didn't say these things were pleasant. In fact, when Paul's writing this, there's... That, uh, you could tell a man that wrote this has been through some adversity. And Paul, before he became Paul, when he was Saul, he used to inflict some persecution on people that had hope. He was one of the ones wanting to silence the hearts and the mouths of believers. But then he writes this, and he says in verse 8, Love never fails. You got to know who you believe in, who you put your trust in, who you put your hope in. Though society decays all around us, this God, this love will never fail. He will never fail. 1 Timothy 1, 4 through 6 says, Nor give heed to feebles and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification. Which is in faith and what I believe in. Now, the purpose of the commandment, love from a pure heart. From a good conscience. And from sincere faith. From which some having strayed, having turned aside to idle talk. You see, our talk affects our walk. Amen? Our talk affects our walk and if we're not walking and talking right then we're we're putting ourselves in a bad way when our lives are focused on our problems we're self-centered not god-centered we've been talking about this in our tuesday night bible study in everyday life how hard is it for you to stay centered in god and 
being self-centered. This will lead you to walk in your own way when we're self-centered, focusing on you and forgetting him and all he went through. Hebrews eleven six. Hebrews 11, verse 6 says this, For without faith, oh, but I have faith. We don't have faith when we focus on the problem. Our faith is diminished. Our faith is watered down. It's diluted. But without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Diligently seeking Him. Through all the adversity, instead of focusing on the adversity, I just bear down like Paul and Silas being thrown in jail, and I just praise him anyway. And I just give him the glory he deserves anyway because he's worthy of that praise. I don't understand why we got to go through these things, but he's worthy of my praise. When we individually begin to put all our trust in Him in every situation, not only will things change around you, things will begin to change in your family. What's going on in your family that you wished wasn't that way? What's going on that you wish was different in your family? What's going on that your family needs some hope? What's going on that you have a need in your family? I'm telling you right now, if you will just begin, you as an individual will begin to praise God and give God the glory He deserves in the face of all that you're going through, your family will change because they will see your praise. They will hear your praise. Our praise is never to be silent and stopped and just hushed and I I can do that in my own privacy. Instead of, you know, and it, it used to be that in the culture that we're in now and things we see in flying out of the closet, I mean everything's come out of the closet, ain't it? It's like a dang spring cleaning has taken place and it's like, good Lord, all that's in there? That is the heart of our culture. And the Christians, when the closets got cleaned out, they went in and shut the door. Get out of the closet. Stop accepting defeat when there's victory. When Jesus hung on that cross and he's on and the, and, 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 and the earth shook again. Go read it. The earth shook again and darkness covered the earth. Three days later. Why did it take three days? If you read that word, Jesus was busy. He went into the heart of hell. And he took the keys from Satan that holds you down. If you're bound today in your life and as a believer and in your family, if you are living bound, I want you to know who has the key. Will you call on him? Will you praise him? Will you give him glory? I'm going to speak boldly. I'm going to come boldly. God, I need some hope. It's okay to say that. God, we need hope. I'm telling you right now as your pastor, we need hope in America. We need hope in a nation. And we're one nation under God. But we're not a nation defeated with God. Because he cannot be defeated. He will not be defeated. And we need to rise up and rejoice in the king of all glory. The God that gave his only begotten son. That whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We need to rise up and give him the praise due his name. And speak it boldly to a nation that's lost and dying and going to hell. But we don't want to hear about hell in our culture. There's, there is no hell. Yes, there's a hell. My question is this. Why do we continue to go through hell when we don't have to have hell anymore? When we individually begin to put all our trust in Him, every situation, not only will things change around you, it'll change in your family, it'll change in your community, and yes, it will change your church. It will change your church. How's it going to do that? Because if every one of us as individuals just begin to give him the praise that, he's, that he deserves, I'm going to worship him anyway. 
yeah, I'm going through some junk. Yeah, it hurts. I ain't pleased at where I'm at at all. But I'm going to give God the praise he deserves. I'm going to give him glory because if when I do that, God is, I'm running that race. I'm running. I ain't quitting. I ain't sitting down. I ain't taking defeat. I'm running my race with Jesus, and I'm focused on him. I'm focused on the prize because we're, what is the end result is that we can have eternal life if we just give him the glory he deserves. Psalms 8, and I'm going to ask Wayne and them to come on. Praise you, Jesus. Verse 1. Let me me just give you verse 4. What is a man that you, O Lord, are mindful of him? What is a man that you are mindful of him? When Jesus hung on the cross, you was on his mind. Who are you? Who are you that you are mindful of Him? Purpose your life in your life from this day forward that whatever you do, you're going to do that, whatever it is, to the glory of God. If I'm having to endure some things and I'm, I'm trying to get away from some stuff and I'm trying to move a, this out of my life and this and I'm, I'm just wanting these shackles, the shackles that Paul and Silas were bound in, that, now the shackles wasn't off. But the praise broke the chains. The praise broke the chains. The place was shaken. Your life, you may feel that shaking in your life. You may feel that earthquake in your life because you're giving glory to the one that paid the price for you, that nothing can hold you down. You're not held down. You're victorious. And when the church becomes the church, it'll be because of a group of individuals have seen the glory of God. They've tasted the favor of God, and they're giving him the praise that he deserves. And this is what I love about my brother Donald. He told me this morning, he told us last week, he said, I was smoking dope and doing things that I did not need to be doing. And I had to go through this thing right here. You can't make his story up, folks. It ain't something he thought of after he got better because Donald, when he got better, he didn't, his mind, he couldn't, he couldn't remember none of us. I asked him at the hospital, do you remember who I am? He said, no. This is what you told me. You said, no. And I said, do you remember living for the Brand Cowboy Church? He went, no. I said, well, do you remember who Jesus is? And he said, yes. So we may have to go through a lot of junk. Maybe even knocking on death's door. But I challenge you to look at what God has done today. In one man's life. And if we'll just give God the glory. And Donald told me this morning. He said, I just want everybody to know that how great my God is and what he's done for me. And I'm challenging you folks wherever you are. There's there's something for you to look at and say, I want what's happened to Donald. And I'm going to tell you this. It's going to be because you remember who he is in the face of your adversity. You remember who he is. His mind didn't remember me, but he remembered the king of glory. What Satan means for evil. God means for good all things work together for good for them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose find God's purpose in your life today y'all stand with me hallelujah hallelujah come on give him a hand clap of praise in this place here we are I'm just going to ask you if you need something from Jesus just come on